Welcome back everyone to another episode and this week I'm gonna be showing you guys how we quarantine Kato, if that's even possible. But more importantly, make your Kato be 100% clean, have no parasites so you have nothing to worry about no matter where you get it from. We're also gonna be hooking up GHL Auto Top Off. I'll be showing you guys how to make a budget auto top off container since I'm still waiting for my custom one. So stay tuned, we got a lot of stuff to cover. All right, so I'll be honest, I got sick and tired of filling this thing with water. I put a tape here just to get a better reference of how much water this tank is going through. So the other day, I filled it up to the top line and then 24 hours later, I added more water and it only came up to where it's at now. So that tells me the tank is consuming a little over a gallon of water a day right now during the winter, uh, which is not too bad. I think during the summer it may go up to like 1.5. A 10 gallon ATO should be enough for a full seven to 10 days. The next part about this, my auto top off, I did finalize already with the company of the brand I wanna go with, but they won't have them ready till about three weeks. Option two is gonna to be to go to Lowe's, get a bucket, plumb it in. Obviously it's gonna look a little bit janky, but it'll at least save me some trips. Just all in all, it'll be less of a headache. So I'm okay with having the bucket next to the tank. So if you guys wondering the auto top off I'm using, it's actually gonna be the GHL auto top off with the float sensor. They have an optical sensor and a float sensor. The reason I didn't do the optical is because the optical runs horizontal. And as you can see, I just don't have the space for that. And honestly, I'm okay with the float stuff. I'm not, you know, I trust electronics to a certain extent, but with the float, I feel a little bit more comfortable with a mechanical uh, float as this one here. So if you do decide to go with the GHL auto top off, they sell a bracket and a rod. This is how it attaches. And you're able to adjust the height of the flow switch by adjusting this piece here and you're also able to adjust it by moving the overall length of the rod. Now in the future, I probably will do two float switches, one for minimum and max, and obviously on the minimum, if it ever got there, the pump would shut off. For today, to keep it simple, I'm gonna show you guys uh, kind of how I do this one. I do need to cut the rod a little bit. I'm gonna cut it. It's gonna be a lot better fit, and we should be good to go. A few moments later. Got the Dremel out. Now I need to look for the plastic cutting wheel. That's this one. This holder. Lastly, this guy. Get this off. New one on. Lower the speed. Probably don't need to do all this, but I don't know. Just want to make it look real nice. So fingers crossed this should be the right length because yeah, it's gonna be pretty hard to add, add it back on if I cut too much off. Now let's just assemble it. Put the nut on the bottom nice and tightened. Make sure this whole assembly is tightened. I left the top a little bit loose so I can still make adjustments and then you also have adjustments via the magnet and where you locate it. So in theory, this should pretty much go back exactly where it was. Here's the back of the magnet. Okay, so that popped right in. Scoot that all the way over. And then I can still loosen the top piece here or the screw. And then you can see I'm able to rotate it, bring it up, bring it down. And then also I can adjust the magnet height as well. I'm happy with that. I have the float where it's just barely making contact. You can actually see barely making contact with the water line. I uh, got this tightened a little bit. I still left the bottom piece loose. So once I turn on the GHL and I see exactly the on and off positions and I'm able to lock that down and get it finalized. But for now, we just clean up the wiring a little bit, make sure both of these uh, run back together. I'll probably use some Velcro straps like I did here. And then that should be good. The next thing is just gonna be hooking it up to the Proflux controller. Here is our on a budget auto top off container. Just went to Lowe's, picked it up. It was, I think under five bucks. All I need to do is just give it a quick rinse with some warm water. You have to make a small hole on the lid, which is where, in my case, just a hose is gonna run. I'm using the 2.1 doser 
as the pump for this so there is no other pump that has to go in the auto top off container so i really only need to do one small tiny little hole just for the silicone to go past it for that I'll be using the trusty step drill bit with the drill i don't want it anywhere near the center i actually want it off centered so i think right here will be a pretty good location that's it we're done that's more than enough for the hose to go in and it should be nice and clean. One of the next steps is obviously going to be to connect the doser. Like I mentioned before, I'm not using a pump to feed water from the auto top off to the tank. I'm going to be using the doser on the Profilux as it's more than able to be pushing a gallon up to two gallons a day, which is ridiculous. You know, your average dosers can't be doing that. It's just too much of a workload. Uh, but I've confirmed it with DHL. They're like, yeah, actually ton of our customers do that. Not only is it great, but it saves you an extra power socket, a lot cleaner setup, and you guys are gonna see exactly how that works. So here on the bottom, we have the 2.1 doser, at least the back end of it, and the Profilux itself. One really neat feature I like about GHL to have the systems communicate with each other it's one cable, which is right here. It's called the PEB cable. So we have that hooked up there, coming up here. And the other thing to hook up is just the power itself to the 2.1 doser. On the front of the 2.1 doser, I obviously hooked up the input and output lines. This is coming from the auto top off container. And then this is going to the sump itself because the pump rotates in this direction. While you are here, it's a great idea to prime the pump. And that's just gonna make sure that there's no air or very little air in the lines themselves, which just makes the next part of it, which is a setup and calibration, a lot easier. Now for this next part, as I mentioned, this is where you program the auto top off to the Profilex controller. It's very simple, very straightforward. I don't feel like boring you guys with that. Not only that, but GHL goes into a lot more detail than I do. Since this isn't really a how-to video on how to set it up, I figure if you guys are looking to set it up, head over to GHL. We'll have a link in the description to show you guys exactly step-by-step -step how to do it. You'll see it's not that difficult. Shouldn't take you more than a few minutes. And I think they would explain it a lot better than I would. One week later. So the Pax Bellum, as you guys know, has been installed kind of almost since the beginning. I haven't really had it running because I was missing a uh, Kato, but I figured what better way to show you guys how you, no matter where you get your Kato, you never again have to worry about it, about having pests. You'll be able to do your own DIY clean Kato at home. Let me show you guys what I'm talking about. We'll very quickly touch on why this is a good idea. So whether you quarantine your fish, don't quarantine your fish, there's always a high probability that Kato can bring a lot of bad stuff in a tank, such as Aptasia, flatworms. Nothing wrong with the pods it brings. Those are actually really beneficial. But again, it's not like you can choose what comes in or doesn't come in. If you're gonna kill, you gotta kill everything. Or if you're gonna introduce, obviously introduce everything. So it's always a great idea to make sure you're able to start from zero. Now, I wouldn't be able to say exactly how effective doing a freshwater dip is, but I can tell you is a freshwater dip, at least for anything over 40 minutes, I can almost guarantee there's nothing gonna be in there. We're gonna be doing two dips in fresh water for two hours each in the middle. There's gonna be some salt water where we kind of let the Kato itself relax a little bit, rinse it off a little bit more, and then it'll come back in for another two hours in the fresh water, just like you see here. Okay, so very simply just put it in. I don't want to break the ball up too much just because I don't want to be digging in there. You can see it's breaking up a little bit, but it's nothing to be too worried about. Set a timer for two hours, let it sit in there. We'll come back, we'll put it in some salt water, and then we'll do another two hour fresh water dip. It's been two hours after the fresh water dip and you can clearly see, I mean, let me see how many I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a really big one there, uh, eight bristle worms. So it seems like when they went in the fresh water, I noticed them like panicking and starting trying to run away, but obviously they had nowhere to go. And you could see a bunch of just small stuff, maybe pods, uh, maybe, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. They're really small, but I can say with certainty, well, I mean, I think that in, the, in and of itself is a little bit of proof. 
Got it here in the salt bucket. Figured I'd put on some gloves because I can feel the bristle worms. I mean, they're dead, yeah, but their spikes are still there. There's actually been a few more that have fallen out. There's one right there, like quite a few others, but they're really small. And again, this is salt water. So here we're just agitating it a little bit to get, a, oh look, you can see a big one there floated away. I'm just inspecting it. Now let's put it in the fresh and we'll leave it in here for a couple hours. After this, we should be able to add it to the tank. I mean, I feel pretty confident of four hours in fresh water. I don't think anything's gonna live as far as parasites, any of that nuisance stuff. So I'd feel pretty confident after this. Now that the Chato's all cleaned out, I'm really happy with it. We can go ahead and remove the Pax Bellum. So we've got the power adapter already pulled. Next, we can go ahead and shut off the flow. Go ahead and disconnect the provided uh, quick connect. There we go. It's obviously a lot easier when you're, you're not trying to do a YouTube video. That was actually pretty easy. You know, another thing I just realized, I can actually leave the manifold open just so the overflow doesn't go all crazy. Actually, that was a lot better. So I guess we can actually leave the manifold open. I'm just gonna have to make sure that I don't pull this out of the, well, Nick, I mean, you could pull it out of the water, but. That's quite some flow coming out of that. Got it all rinsed out. There was a few more pieces that came out of the bristle worms. They were long dead. They were just stuck inside. You can see it. I have it there. Also, we got reactor here. For now, we're going to add it just in the bottom chamber. And then once it starts getting really filled, I'll add a portion of it to the top. Just finished getting it all hooked up. It's really just going to be a waiting game now. I think within about a week to a couple weeks based on what the levels are. We should start seeing a pretty good result. I got the manifold wide open. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's pushing about 350 gallons an hour, uh, which should be more than enough for the Pax Bellum, at least according to the manual. So that's gonna be it for this week's episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. More importantly, you learned something and you finally found a new way where you can get any Kato from any source and make it be 100% pest free. Not only that, maybe you found a new way you can make your own budget auto top off container if you're not looking to spend some big bucks. Guys, that's gonna be it for this week's episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. I thank each and every one of you very much for watching. If you guys have missed this Friday's video, it's getting a ton of views. It's a video where I talk about adding vegetable oil to the reef tank. Well, we don't really add it to the reef tank, but if you did miss it, be sure to check that out. So if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave them down in the comment box below. I thank each and every one of you very much for watching. As always, happy reefing.